Good morning and thank you for joining me today. This morning we're going to be talking about quite an important subject. It's a question that we have to answer. And it is, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Now, at face value, I'm sure that many Christians would identify as both a fan and a follower of Jesus. But now that I've said this, I can imagine that many of you are cautiously saying, you know, Craig, is, is there a difference between the two? And is it not perhaps the same thing? And must I choose one over the other? Is there a wrong answer? And um, what if I asked you to choose one over the other? Choose between the two. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Or are you more of a fan than a follower or more of a follower than a fan? And for purposes of this exercise that we're going to do with one another this morning, you can't say both. I want you to try and decide between the two. And let's work through the message and make this decision at the end. So let's turn to Scripture. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, reading from the New International Version. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good pleasing and perfect will. So let's start answering this question. What if I said that a disciple of Jesus is a follower, not a fan? What if I also said that it is probable that too many Christians are fans and not enough are followers? And as we work through this message, I ask that you prayerfully reflect over matters and allow the Holy Spirit to guide your heart. Now, technically, a fan is an enthusiastic devotee. In other words, an admirer. And it's easy to admire Jesus and be that enthusiastic devotee. And at face value, there might seem nothing wrong with this. I mean, let's be honest with one another for a moment. Who wouldn't want to be enthusiastic about Jesus and admire all he's done? You can be a fan of Jesus from a distance. You can be a fan of Jesus when you raise your hand and pray. You can be a fan of Jesus when you say grace before your meal. You can be a fan of Jesus by sticking the cross on the back of your car or one of those fishes that you see. You can be a fan of Jesus by attending every church service, every choir practice, every prayer meeting, and every cell group. But Jesus called us to follow him. And we don't follow him because of who he is. We don't follow him just because of what he's taught. We follow him because of what he did. We follow him because we want to become like him. So it's much fuller than just who he is. It's much fuller than just what he taught. It's because what he's done. It's because of us wanting to become like him. Let me use an illustration. A pastor was invited to speak at another church, and as is usual, the church asked for a biography of the pastor and a photograph. And, you know, in this way, they then advertise the event and they properly introduce him. And this is normal. So far, so good. And the pastor lands at the airport. And as is usual, you know, when you get off an airplane, especially during the day in the business times, there's people holding signs, people's names, names on it. But his name was not there. Instead, there was this elderly woman and she was like frowning and studying what appeared to be a photograph. And this pastor walked up to her and said, you might be looking for me. And the elderly lady replied, are you really pastor so-and-so? You don't look like your picture at all. And that awoke a question in me. If I, Craig, want to become like Jesus, to what degree do I look like his picture? In other words, when people look at my behavior, my way of thinking, my attitude, my heart for the lost, and the things that I do, what do they see? What am I reflecting back to them? 
What is the witness of everything about me and within me? Does it say fan or follower? So let's recall verse 2 from this morning's scripture reading. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's work briefly, quickly, with the verbs conform and transform. Now, let's compare this word form, conform, to what the more talented amongst us can do with jelly. Now, jelly, when freshly made, is liquid. It run, can run anywhere, basically, and it's poured into a number of molds. And these molds can be a cross shape, or they can be round, a star, whatever you want it to be. That's the nice thing about jelly. But as this jelly cools down, it's going to conform to the shape around it. And once it's cold, that becomes the jelly's permanent shape. So you can at some stage remove the mold, and the jelly that is set now stays in that shape. And that is exactly what the Greek behind the translation is saying. Conform to the same pattern. Fashion self according to. There's no inner transformation. The jelly is still jelly, no matter if it's star or round shaped by its mold. It doesn't stop being jelly because of the shape of the mold. Transformed, on the other hand, speaks of a metamorphosis. And this is indeed the Greek behind the translation transformed. And if we look at metamorphosis from a zoological point of view of all points, it means the process of transformation from an immature form to an adult form. And if we turn to some dictionaries and, you know, try to get our head around it a bit more, we read change of physical form, structure or substance, especially by supernatural means. Another definition here is a striking alteration in appearance, character or circumstances and a major change in the appearance or character of someone or something. In other words, when we speak about metamorphosis transformed, and we go back to the image of the jelly, if it transforms, the jelly is no longer jelly. Something radical must have happened inside of this jelly that caused it to stop being jelly. And it's noticeable. In other words, to transform speaks of an inward, outward change that people can see. And it is here that the zoological point of view resonates with me because it implies maturity, growing up. And this is what is expected of us when we convert to Christianity. We must grow up. We must mature spiritually and emotionally as the Holy Spirit works within us and we start reflecting Christ. This is part of our spiritual maturation. It's our growing up. It's our journey of faith. We strive towards the likeness of Jesus in thought, in word, and in deed. And everything about us should testify to being a serious follower of Jesus. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. One writer, McKnight, wrote here, We all reflecting as mirrors the glory of the Lord. Another writer, Locke, said, With open countenances as mirrors reflecting the glory of the Lord. The second definition of metamorphosis spoke of supernatural means. And as we said, jelly on its own can never ever be anything else other than jelly. And jelly left to its own will always conform to the shape around it. I mean, that's what jelly does. But if something beyond the natural world of jelly acts within this jelly itself, it undergoes a metamorphosis and reflects back to the person looking at it, back to the observer, in other words, what the supernatural cause of change is. Perhaps I can use another image to try to explain this. Way back when, Robbies had disciples who followed them around on dusty pathways as they went from place to place. This was many years ago. And as they followed, they learned from this Robbie. But because they were following the Robbie, 
the disciples were eventually covered by the dust that the rabbi kicked up as he was walking. And in a sense, this was a compliment to the disciple. It was evidence in both the appearance of the disciple and in the level of knowledge of the disciple that he was a follower. So, a fan of the rabbi might have just waved or acknowledged somewhere as the rabbi passes by and I've seen you, I'm taking note of this. But the followers would be covered in dust. When preparing this message, I also reflected on the end times, you know, the times that we're moving into or already have moved into. And I wanted to describe to you what the pattern of the world is that you shouldn't conform to. Would you believe me if I said I found this surprisingly difficult and surprisingly easy at the same time? Because when we conform to a pattern, it means that we fit in. We don't stand out anymore. Or shall I say, perhaps more relevant for today, we don't stand up anymore. Because the word of God in history reveals many who stood up for their faith in the world. They did not conform, despite the consequences of not conforming. When you switch on the television, when you listen to conversation, when you buy a newspaper, you will see what is happening in the world. You will notice that the general narrative, this that you're hearing, is negative. It's fear-based. It's grumbling. It's complaining. It's gossiping. It's full of doubt. Brothers and sisters, do not conform. Stand out by maintaining a biblical perspective. Be positive because you can. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. Be encouraging. Be hopeful. Be that light in the darkness. Be a follower of Jesus. Have you noticed the gossiping, the swearing, the drunkenness, sleeping around? You know, here I'm talking about fornication as well as adultery. How far do you have to look before you see this? Do you suppose that any of this is pleasing to God? Do you know that the people you spend time with will influence you? Now, there's a positive there as well, because it always sounds like a negative, but there's a positive as well. It also means you can influence them. So do not conform. Stand out. Don't compromise your beliefs. You are in the world, not of the world. You are born again. And we bear that charge to deliver different results, even though we are exposed to the same conditions, same circumstances, same pressures, same darknesses as many other people on this planet who don't know Jesus and are merely fans of Jesus. Or You know what I'm getting at here. But let me bring it together. Christians are concerned about their own and other people's physical and mental challenges. They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about politics. They're concerned about human rights. But are they also concerned about worship, sin, grace, idolatry, metamorphosis, and evangelism? The little word but is what separates fans and followers. There's nothing wrong with being a fan of Jesus. As long as you are first and foremost a follower of Jesus that reflects the glory of God. To the glory of God is why he made us. We're not called to blend in. We as the church, the followers of Jesus Christ, are called out of the world. And the footprints of Jesus that we are to follow are visible right through Genesis 1 verse 1 to Revelation 22 verse 21. So, brothers and sisters, may you be covered in the dust of Jesus as you follow him. I close with Romans 11 verse 36. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I will see you again next week, Sunday. And um, until we meet again, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord strengthen you as Christ is reflected off of you. Bye-bye.